uh, we will be hearing from a number of witnesses on the Budget Adjustment Act. We've been asked by the Appropriations Committee to weigh in on the proposals being changed. So just a quick primer on what a Budget Adjustment Act is. It's just the mid-year review of, um, first of all, it's a review of how the budget as we passed it back last May is functioning, but also these are requests for um, additional fundings this particular year and the funding can either be from some of the general fund balance that we uh, have heard that there is a surplus or it might be ARPA money uh, that is being asked to be distributed in addition to the funds that were distributed back in um, through the budget in May. So with us today, we have Commissioner Hanford uh, from, from the Department of Housing and Community Development, Gus Dielig and Jen Holler from VHCB, Maura Collins from VHFA, and we're expecting um, Commissioner Gresham from the, um, from the fiscal office for the, for the administration to discuss what's here. The budget adjustment letter is available on our website. And um, it does start off with a, with a question about funding for um, some military issues. We will try to track down the National Guard um, in the next couple of days to ask them about uh, about their feelings on this. It seems like it's fairly straightforward. There is a change, but and there is a italicized information that talks about what the changes are are um, are about. But today. Um, we're going to be talking about requests for money to be forwarded to uh, different organizations for some of the programs that have been in place. And I'll just um, leave it there for right now. We, this is the only topic we're discussing this morning, so I'm not sure we'll be here for three hours, but, um, but we're not in any hurry to uh, rush through some of this information. Um, so I'll just pass the microphone right over to Commissioner Hanford and uh, let him discuss the administration requests for, um, for what's in the what's in the budget adjustment act. So good morning, Josh. Good morning. Uh, for the record, Josh Hanford, Commissioner of Vermont Department of Housing and Community Development. Um, hopefully, uh, you are all off to. A good new year, as good as it, good as it can be anyways. And uh, thanks for inviting me in so early and the rest of the folks here. Um, I'll just, you know, sort of start real high level here and just state the obvious from the beginning that uh, we know finding housing that Vermonters can afford is challenging all across the state right now. We hear it from everyone every single day. Um, <clears throat> you know, that's why the the governor and the legislature has already pushed for some of the largest investments in housing um, in Vermont's history over the last few years. Um, and we're doing that again here with the Budget Adjustment Act. You know, more funding uh, available to build and repair housing is needed now, and, and it can't wait till the end of this session. Um, we have tremendous amounts of ARPA uh, state fiscal recovery funding available and an ever-growing housing crisis that calls for more action now. Um, last year, we focused heavily on permanent housing for the homeless. Um, you know, as a result, you know, we were able to, to build um, around 800 new permanently affordable homes um, and another 800 are, are currently under development. You know, with that, we've also helped over 1,300 families uh, exit homelessness into some form of permanent housing, which, you know, um, ma makes a big difference out there in the community. It, we're also helping the folks that have homes already make them more affordable with uh, support for heating and weatherization and carbon emissions. Um, much of this work was funded with ARPA funds and, and one-time general funds, but we know we have much more work to do to provide the housing that Vermonters need right now. Another area that we hear more and more is, is Vermont's middle income and working families are also experiencing a housing crisis. We have an all time low inventory of homes for sale. Uh, we simply, you know, have we simply have not been building enough homes for decades. And uh, there's a tremendous lack of decent, affordable homes for working middle income families to purchase. 
We just don't have the supply and, and we need to jumpstart the construction of more modest homes built in Vermont. Without more modest price homes available, the workers we need like nurses and teachers can't afford to live in Vermont. And it creates a spiral of crises that all link back to housing availability, supply at multiple income levels and types of housing need. You know, this lack of housing in Vermont is holding us back. It's holding us back from recovery. It's holding us back from opportunity and growth. And the governor believes we can't afford to wait any longer to make more investments in affordable housing. You know, the benefits of good homes should be within reach of every Vermonter. And we have the chance to do that um, now and in an ongoing way over the next few years with the, the resources we have. So in the $80 million budget adjustment um, act, $80 million is the request. Most of it uh, ARPA funds. Uh, there's $20 million that is to in ARPA to continue the successful Vermont Housing Improvement Program, which supports affordable apartment and ADU creation in existing properties with a focus on vacant and code violating properties. The first round of, of VHIP in 2020 used $7.5 million in, in CRF money to create 240 units of affordable housing with approximately half serving households exiting homelessness. Uh, I have numbers on, you know, sort of which towns those are in, but every county in Vermont had units. The next $5 million in ARPA funding was approved last session to continue VHIP, and it's already been fully obligated and will produce approximately 150 new units, all serving families exiting homelessness again in every region of the state. The goal with this $20 million BAA ask with ARPA funds is to seamlessly continue this cost-effective program and create over 400 new units to serve households exiting homelessness and families in need of quality, affordable housing. You know, this program also uh, supports neighborhood reinvestment. It bolsters grand lists and it will produce, um, and is a smart growth housing policy by investing in the underutilized housing stock we already have. I see questions. I don't know if you want me to, to stop at each section or, or go through. I'm, I'm happy if it's related to, to this piece to, to take questions as they come. Um, are you at, at a spot where you feel like you can stop before you move on to the next section? Yes, yeah, so I'm going to jump into the, the next uh, $50 million for VHCB. Okay. Um, Representative Hango, this is on the, on the VHIP ask. Yes, please. Could you um, repeat those numbers for 2020 and 2021, the amount spent and the number of units built, please? Sure. So it was uh, $7.5 million in CRF money that produced 240 units with about half serving the homeless. And the 5 million in ARPA funds approved last session has all been obligated. Those units aren't, aren't built yet. Um, and, but the estimates from the home ownership centers are for 150 units. Um, and those are all targeted to serve those exiting homelessness. They received more requests than the 5 million we had. So we had to cut all the requests back and, um, you know, award them a proportional amount in their, their estimates actually totaled up to around 160 units, but with the, the, the cuts, we're, we're estimating more like 150 at this point. Thank you. And Commissioner Hanford, just one of the issues with the VHIP program, you mentioned that, that there was um, X amount of dollars spent using the 2020 CRF funds in the program that we did immediately after uh, the COVID crisis started. And as you know, the, the, the bill that would have um, further clarified or evolved the VHIP program was, was vetoed last year. What are you, and so we don't have that in, in, in statute. And I understand we have it in the budget. We had it in the budget and, and um, the administration feels like they're fine using it in the way that you just described and providing these units. Can you just fill us in on what standards you're using in 
in putting out the money or using the standards that were created under the CRF money or under the, under the bill that isn't, you know, under the standards where we felt like, where we all felt like the program had evolved to. Um, sure, sure. Um, you know, the, the standards that we used for CRF money and the standards we used uh, to distribute this last 5 million are, are really the same. They were the following the policy that was in S79 of a maximum $30,000 grant with a match requirement um, and a slight difference between whether folks were committed to serving homeless folks exiting homelessness or um, you know folks um, or just uh, requiring those units to be affordable to families below 80% AMI. What we actually did with the 5 million was require all the units to serve folks exiting homelessness because the need so critical, um, AHS uh, partnered, and we just made that a requirement of the, the sort of the RFP, if you will, to the home ownership centers. And they had no problem with landlords accepting that responsibility. Um, they saw the benefits um, and the need to do that. So our, you know, sort of, policy that we're using for these funds is actually, I would say, more restrictive than what the, the, the policy uh, was in S79 at this point. I think one of the challenges going forward, and I've been asked this um, during the summer by Joint Fiscal Committee, um, in the fall by uh, appropriations, is folks were asking, how many ADUs did you produce with this, this funding? And the answer is very little, because ADUs cost more money you're building a new apartment as opposed to repairing something that's offline and the $30,000 cap is, is not enough. And we were under um, very short time restrictions, um, especially with the CRF money that building ADUs from scratch within that 10 months that got, you know, magically extended at the 11th hour um, just wasn't in the cards, but we've been pushed to, to look at more ADU and ADU unit creation with these funds, um, you know, and frankly, some of the easier to fix apartments are, are getting harder to find. So, um, you know, like a lot of things during this pandemic, I think um, having flexibility and choice to respond to what the market is throwing us is, is going to be needed, frankly. Um, you know, thirty thousand dollars is 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 an incredible bargain for getting units online and having you know folks exiting homeless committed to those units. And um, I, I'm I'm anticipating we haven't seen it now, but I'm anticipating that um, thirty thousand dollar apartments and ADUs are going to be harder and harder to find with um, construction costs, supplies, materials all increasing. Um. One more question on VHIP from Representative Brown. Thank you, Chair Stevens. Uh, good to see you, Josh. Um, one question. So uh, S79 had, or actually the Arbor money, uh, no, excuse me, the CARES money, <laughs> sorry, um, had um, a requirement that there be a covenant attached to apartments that were renovated via a grant. My question is, did that, um, covenant extend to the five million in ARPA funds that we're using now. Yes, yes, absolutely. In, okay. in fact, the covenant goes with whatever, if whether it's a grant or a uh, forgivable loan. There is a, a housing uh, covenant that goes with these properties. Um, we're uh, in when they transfer because a couple of these apartments have sold during this period. Um, and that gets recorded. We sign off on it. The new owner has that responsibility, you know, between the home ownership centers, um, you know, the legal instruments we put in place in the department, you know, seeing any transfer, um, you know, th this, we, we feel like this is covered and, and there's good practice already around this through what we do with um, some of the CDBG money through the home ownership centers for those repair programs that we've you know, been doing for 25 years, they all operate with this same housing uh, covenant placed in the, the uh, land records and so forth. One follow-up is, um, are you suggesting that this new $20 million ask um, that there be a provision that um, more than $30,000 can be used to renovate an apartment that 
would require more than 30,000 and that that would be adjusted through fewer renovations or borrowing from one to another. Is that what you're suggesting here, Josh? Yeah, I, well, I'm raising the issue and I've been asked, um, you know, from appropriators about this very issue because the budget language is, is not specific. It just authorizes X amount to carry out, um, you know, a rental rehabilitation program on existing units or ADUs. Um, it doesn't specify the parameters. Like many of our housing programs, they, you know, authorize an, a, a dollar amount and set a goal. You know, they don't um, decide whether you're gonna allow, you know, um, you know, X amount of insulation or um, X amount of, uh, of every specific requirement. And so if we're going to hit ADUs and if we're going to keep meeting the need as costs rise, I, I think we're gonna be pushed into that. Um, if you look at the numbers that I have outlined for this 20 million to create over 400 units, that 400 units divided by $30,000 per grant, it, it would be more than that. So. I'm already suggesting that some of the costs are going to rise and that, you know, the homeownership centers that we grant these funds to are going to try to get the best bang for the buck they can. And that um, we will and so forth, but we have to be realistic that costs are increasing and that, you know, do we want to say no to a, a possible project that's going to cost $42,000 an X particular community, you know, that has some great projects online um, that, that could come online. I, I think that's going to be, you know, one of the things that this, this committee, um, the appropriators, um, you know, I'm just being open about that this is, this is going to be something we're gonna have to deal with. Would we be placing the authority with your agency to do such a thing? I believe that's how I believe that's how it would work if there's an amount appropriated the department like all you know agencies well I don't know if all but certainly DHCD and all elements of agency of commerce community development in our statute allows us to develop programs grant programs housing community development programs we've we've done tons of them um, and most of them don't specify you know the level of detail that would that would um, you know, require us to, to, to seek, you know, clarification on moving a, a maximum $10,000 or so forth, as long as the goals and the higher level, um, uh, you know, yeah, I guess I would just say the goals and outcomes are defined by the legislation. Very good. Thank you, Josh. Thanks. So Josh, go ahead on, on to the uh, VHCB funds. Okay, next, um, there's $50 million of this $80 million uh, budget adjustment is um, targeted for Vermont Housing and Conservation Board to receive for mixed income, multifamily rental and shelter expansion. You know, the goal here is to continue, uh, continued funding is needed to support the pipeline of projects in development with a priority on projects serving households exiting homelessness and other forms of supportive housing, um, you know, particular recovery housing or other, other needs out there. Um, a goal here that, that we've, we've talked about is uh, 250 units. Um, you know, these are more permanent, um, you know, new projects, there's a higher per unit cost and we need to send a strong signal to continue, um, keep, keep continue developing projects keep working with our housing developers out, out there of all types to bring these projects. You know, VHCB has been tremendous in moving the money they already have. You know, they have a board meeting coming up um, here in, in, in the next uh, few weeks, I believe, with over $50 million in requests already. So this is a signal that we need to keep this money moving. You know, we'll have a whole nother budget to debate the rest of the session about uh, additional dollars, um, both you know, general fund and ARPA, um, but this is to keep the pipeline moving to award um, more funding that we have available right now um, to address this housing crisis. Happy to try to answer questions, but you know, you do have uh, Gus and, and Jen here to for details on that for certain. Yeah, we'll um, we'll get to them um, 
for details when we're done, I think with with you so you don't have to keep bouncing around. Um, and then and then can you give us an introduction to the uh, the the next the middle the missing middle home ownership program? Sure. Um, so another five million dollars we're proposing ARPA is to establish a, a missing middle income homeownership development pilot program. That is a mouthful. We're working on sort of a new name. I believe when when Maura uh, speaks, she, she may mention a, a different way to describe this. Um, but it it this is really to support the development and construction of new modest priced homes for purchase by you know middle income working families. Um, this pilot program is a partnership between Department of Housing and Community Development and Vermont Housing Finance Agency with input um, from VHCB. We've been working and meeting um, for, for months now really to talk about what this program should look like, what should be the components. It's really based off a national model, which um, proposes to provide construction and development financial subsidies for new construction or substantial rehabilitation of owner of new and owner occupied homes. Um, it, the funds will be used to support uh, home builders access to upfront construction capital through Vermont banks and credit unions and provide a direct project subsidy for up to 35% of the eligible develop, uh, development costs per home. And it will serve a, a sort of broad spectrum of affordability um, and the sales price of the home you know, we'll, we'll be capped to, to um, uh, you know, not move into that next uh, sort of bracket of, of, of upper middle income homes and so forth. This is really meant to increase the supply of modest homes that we're just not seeing the market bring online naturally. And it's been, you know, decades since we've really um, built these sort of left to the market to, to accomplish this on their own. Um, you know, I, I, I really want to save a lot of the details here for more to talk through with you, but we've been hearing this need from all corners uh, of the state, from all, um, you know, uh, perspectives, and it really gets to that. We, we really can't be successful on our other goals of, of addressing our workforce challenges, you know, keeping nurture, nurses and teachers here. If we can't have you know, homes for folks to move into, first time purchase, first generation purchase, you know, folks can't move out of rental housing if they can't find a modest home to, to purchase. And we're really stuck in the, and in, in we're not, we don't have a complete housing cycle here and we need to do something. This is a modest pilot program to try something new based on a national model that's been getting a lot of attention. Um, you know, the Build Back Better bill is stalled, but we still think this has merit and we ought to um, try something here um, to get this get this moving. Um, I, I guess I, I will I will I will hold back more more details on that for for VHFA to talk to. Um, wanted to know if you wanted me to hit very briefly on what is also also in the BAA. It's not in the DHCD's ask. It's actually in the Department of Children and Families, but it's a a statewide rental risk pool as well. But I see some hands up, maybe they're for the missing middle income homeownership piece. Um, so Chip, I believe your hand is up from before. Um, I do have a question, Chair. Okay, and then Representative Murphy. Okay, um, just quickly, um, will there be income guidelines for this uh, money that you just spoke of, John, Josh? Yes, absolutely, There, there's maximum, um, household income caps, as well as uh, price of homes that they can purchase. But it is a, it is a newer model that um, suggests that um, we need to provide families that are trying to get a start into home ownership that don't have the resources to do that, uh, a, a chance to get into home ownership and to create some wealth and pass it on. Um, this is becoming more and more of a, a, an equity issue across um, different, um, different communities in, in this country. And people are recognizing that our housing policy for the last, you know, 100 years ha, ha, is, is focused on, you know, affordable housing rental for, for low income and very low income. And if you were lucky enough to get into home ownership, you had great um, chances to pass on that wealth and you had, you know, tax benefits, but if you don't have the resources to get into it, to start with, 
you're just out of luck and it, it's creating um, a, a real disparity in, in, in wealth across different communities in our country. And, and there's increased efforts to try to do something here that we want to model in Vermont. Yeah, I would, I would agree. I have heard from a number of working people who have for one reason or another been displaced and have not been able to find a new place to, to live or to even or contractors to build a new place. So I, I, I would go along with that. Are we talking about uh, in excess of 100% of AMI uh, for qualifications on this? Yeah, I mean, yes. Yeah. So so um, many of the standards for what they define as um, uh, affordable federal programs that do exist that allow for help with affordable housing go up to 120% AMI. Um, that That is some of the standards we have, some of the standards that BHCB has. This federal program is modeled to go up to 140%. Um, the you less subsidy is provided into the home, the higher up you go. So you know between 80% and 140%, it's sort of a sliding scale of the amount of subsidy. So folks on the higher end of that level are receiving less subsidy. You know they they can afford to purchase a, a home that costs more than someone at 100% AMI is generally how it works. And I think, you know, Maura will have a few uh, uh, slides that sort of in some way demonstrates that maybe all the numbers aren't there um, because, you know, th this is this is still developing. Yeah. Great. Thanks again, Josh. Yeah. Murphy. yeah, this is just um, a detail and I know we'll get lots more, but um, it, when we talk about modest home price and the actual construction of new, I'm just curious if there's a dollar value being placed on that because affordable housing has always been one of those things I wryly say when I was in our development review board because um, it's 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 still pricey. <laughs> it's it's very pricey and it's it's increasing fast, unfortunately. Um, you know, I don't want to throw exact numbers out there, but um, because I don't have them in my head right now, but um, you know, it's based on bedroom size. So if you're doing a two bedroom home versus a three bedroom home, there's different price escalators and you know, VHFA already provides um, lending you know, products to help folks get into affordable um, homes that, that have these caps. Um, I think it's fair to say that when most people you know, hear you know, $350,000 for, for maybe someone at a hundred, 120 percent AMI, they might say that's not affordable, but that's what the numbers show. Someone at one hundred and twenty percent could afford. Um, I think another interesting tidbit to throw in here is, you know, this program is meant to um, to sort of uh, build upon some of our other programs we have, like the down payment assistance, shared equity, other models that help folks um, afford that home purchase. The problem is there aren't enough homes to put that down payment assistance towards. You know, we, that is not a supply side solution. We're talking about supply side solutions of development, getting builders and developers to undertake more housing development and committing up front to commit to more of those homes to be at this price point rather than $500,000, which they can sell like that tomorrow on the market, we need them to commit to $350,000 homes. Um, that, and so that was what I was looking 000. for. I, exactly. Yeah, yeah, I, I, I was curious because I was looking at that supply side as opposed to how, you know, the buyer's perspective and the, the restrictions on their incomes and all that. I, I was curious when we're talking about granting um, monies and support to the development of the housing, to the co construct of it. <laughs> I, I was curious. And so it would still be within that VHFA guidance. Parameters. Yes. And there's okay. two components of this. One is um, for um, a, a risk share. So when folks go and get construction financing, they still have to, it costs $400,000 to build a modest home that we need to sell for $300,000. Let's use that right. really simple, but they still need to borrow the money at $400,000 because that's the true construction price. So we need to subsidize the construction lending to build more. And then we need to uh, have a subsidy to bring down that cost for fo modest folks to afford that home. So this, this program, this pilot has two components, more access to capital at the prices we want them to construct it at, and then actually a buy down subsidy 
so the households can uh, uh, afford to get into those homes that the de uh, developer builder has committed to set aside for, for folks and not offer on the market at five hundred thousand dollars. And um, you know, Mora has a, a, some some good slides sort of explaining this. Thank you. Hey, Representative Kalaki. Thank you. Uh, good morning, Josh. And, good morning. Uh, thank you for all your kind of um, entrepreneurial uh, visioning on, on our housing crisis. I appreciate it, the work you've done. Um, you. I'm a little, uh, in South Burlington, we had inclusionary zoning um, for the last three years, and now it's, it's moved to something else. But it was quite complex for developers, of course, to uh, if they're developing large plots of land to include uh, 10 or 15% of what would be affordable. But that is also a way that I, it did help South Burlington be more integrated. Um, I, I'm, I'm, I'm here, I'm trying to understand this and I'll learn more details from more, I'm sure. But I, I, I hear your supply side, but isn't the revolving loan fund that at $5 million dollars, with VHCP for shared equity, doing the same thing, but giving it to the homeowners versus the developers. And couldn't we, I think that five year revolving loan fund was capitalized 1 million a year for five years. Couldn't we build that up more quickly now with dollars in your kind of overall proposal to help with that? And I think that that is, um, it also keeps those buildings affordable in the future, as I understand it. So um, I, I, I hear you're saying you want a lot of different strategies, but why not build that up at the same time? Yeah, I think uh, this program can uh, work in conjunction with the shared equity model. Absolutely. I think, um, you know, a couple different things going on here. Um, the shared equity you know, program targets you know, even lower income households getting them into homes. And it, so it requires a larger subsidy than, than some of this model. Um, you know, someone at 120% AMI to get into a, to get a home built, to get people to build more of those homes and get into them requires less subsidy. And so we can do more units is the hope. And it's a different model that that home is restricted forever to stay always affordable to never which family moves in there. And, you know, the family, when they sell it, their equity is tied to the benefit they received early, earlier. And, you know, um, the rapid appreciation of that home, you know, works well for a family that's exiting to take some of that equity to move to a different location somewhere. Um, that model doesn't always um, maybe work in, you know, say a Rockingham or someplace where that home isn't appreciating as fast. Um, but still they need to sell the home. They need to move for whatever reason in five or 10 years. And, you know, this, this model has some chance for that uh, family to take some of that wealth generation uh, and, and, and move it on, you know, frankly, to provide it um, to their family to build wealth, you know, as the American dream, you know, envisioned. Um, and so it's, it's a couple different strategies that aren't mutually exclusive, they can work together and enhance each other. Um, and it's still that the shared equity program um, isn't often, um, you know, a, a, as much of a supply side solution as it is an individual household solution to get into a home that already exists or is available. And we're running short supply on those. So we need more homes built that we can incentivize for, by you know, lower construction loans and risk shares there and various subsidy models, including shared equity and this model that moves um, up the income ladder a little bit as well. They, they work together, I guess is a short answer. Uh, but, but why not capitalize to the 5 million for the shared equity program right now? Yeah, I guess I'm not familiar with what exactly you're referring to capitalize the, the, the 5 million RLF. Um, that maybe is a question for, for Gus. Okay, I'll, I'll, I'll ask him. Um, yep. I, and I, because, you know, it is state dollar. So I, I'm thinking the shared equity, people do get equity if it grows. They, 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 right? So there is some equity acquisition there if they resell it, but it does remain permanently affordable. And so with state dollars, I think the investment is what's best for the state and the community 
that exists afterwards. So I, 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 I have to learn more about it, Josh. I, yeah. I just yeah. I'm trying to get details around. It. I'll get happy, it from happy to happy to chat more on it. I think that you know we're proposing ARPA dollars here, which are abundant and um, can work in a model that doesn't um, lock those funds up in perpetuity. That's the ARPA, you know challenge right now right that we have to spend these and they can't be locked up in a loan for permanent um so that's one way why we're proposing arpa funds can work in this model and not um directly for shared equity so to speak and that the shared equity you know just real quick you know it's only 25 percent of the equity is um able to to move on of the entire appreciation of that home so you have to have a lot of appreciation um, in, in certain markets for that to really be an asset that can be moved on um, to another location. It, it's successful. Don't don't take my words um, uh, out of context there. But it just we need more than that tool. We need to pilot some new solutions because we've had the shared equity model for a long time in Vermont and it's very successful. But we're not seeing enough supply come online. We're 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 just not. Thank you very much. Yeah. And specifically, Josh, just to be clear, we're not seeing enough supply come online for another economic level above where shared equity has traditionally been. I mean, we're we're proposing to go into an area of of um, helping Vermonters gain housing at a, at a high higher level of AMI um, than we have in the past with this program with this proposal. Yeah, I mean, in real, real uh, sort of high level terms, the way I think about it is we've always been in a, a scarcity of dollars, of resources to put towards affordable housing development. And so rightly, we've always focused on serving the needs of the very lowest income first. It's in all of our policies. It's, you know, we, we build apartments and homes serving the lowest income households first. You know, over this last few years with resources flowing in, one, we have more resources. Two, we've, we have focused to date primarily on folks at the lowest income with all these funds, you know, building, you know, 1600 units uh, of housing, you know, with um, mainly targeted to those exiting homelessness, lots of new programs. We're seeing the need to focus on, um, you know, income slightly higher than that. Our housing sort of um, entire spectrum of housing has a huge gap in the middle. And it's this sort of modest missing middle income you hear it referred to. It's just not available. And it's really going to affect our sort of working families moving forward and um, put us in at risk for a lot of other issues, workforce, folks to serve on our, you know, our volunteer boards and work in our hospitals, it's its becoming the thing that um, screams the loudest from the economic development world and all the businesses are saying, we need housing. How can we help um, build housing for our, you know, uh, middle income paid workers because they're saying they can't find a home in Vermont uh, despite what we think is a good salary. Um, and, and it's its becoming a, um, a, a, a just a, a crisis level at every, every corner. So it's it's time to put some proposals on the table um, to address this this area as well. Representative Byron. Thank you, Chair. Uh, good to see you, Commissioner. Hope all's well. Um, I got a just a what I think is a quick question on that uh, AMI uh, affordability calculation we were talking about. Um, I think it's it's absolutely mind boggling. When we're talking about affordable housing prices in like the three hundred thousand dollar range, but um, so when you're talking about establishing this like you know affordable mortgage payment, is that including um, property tax obligation, possibly mortgage insurance, or are you just looking at like like baseline bank note? Yeah, no, um, great question. When, when they calculate what's affordable to folks at 80% AMI, 100, 120, up to 140, and look at what they should be paying for their total housing costs, it's um, mortgage, property tax, and homeowners insurance. You know, just like um, rental, when you calculate those same um, what's affordable to folks at different income levels, it, it's, it, it's supposed to be rent and utilities. So that's you know the the mortgage um, that a family can afford for the price of home they can afford. It's all factoring all, all those components. 
baking all that in. Okay, wonderful. Thank you. I'm glad to hear that. All right, Commissioner. Um, and, and you've done a great job, like getting Maura Collins all lined up. But we'll get to her. <laughs> um, we'll get to her in a, in a little while. Uh, the last piece that's in here, and I'm not sure if you're the right person to ask, uh, or if it'll be uh, Commissioner or Secretary Gresham. It just the idea of um, the bottom of page two. There's a there's a uh, exclusions. And it's going to allow that, um, it looks like that it, it's going to expand the scope of the statutory exclusions pertaining to residential rental agreements to include occupancy and housing funded by um, federal emergency rental assistance funds. And is that a question for you or for, um, or, or, or for someone else? Interesting. I'm not prepared to answer that question. I, I don't know um, what page number you're referring to I'll that's on to page that. two of the letter that was sent to us from the appropriations committee mm -hmm. um no we'll hold off on that right now we don't we will we'll we'll seek that out okay um the one thing i did want to mention and, and it's it's like i said not in dhed's baa ask but um it, it's in department of children and families is there's five million to establish a statewide rental risk pool which provide it, which is targeted to provide up to five thousand dollars to repair documented damages by by tenants referred slash rehoused through different AHS assistance programs. Um, you know, and this is meant to to repair damages that are, are a result of unsuccessful uh, tenancies um, through some of these rehousing programs because when those units get damaged, uh, it results in off units offline, which we can't afford right now, and a greater hesitancy from those landlords to participate in these sort of programs again. And really DCF, if you wanna hear about this, um, should, should speak in more detail, it's in their BAA. Um, we have worked on it with them. Um, this is one of the recommendations, um, as, as well as continuing VHIP, actually all these components from the GA Housing Working Group, you know, they proposed uh, a statewide rental risk pool like this that um, saw the value there. There's a lot of states that have these. Washington State is who we're modeling this program after the $5,000 uh, repair for damage limit is based on what they've seen really successful. Um, and DCF has operated sort of spot programs like this in the past. And it seems really important to have a statewide program like this right now when we have lots of rehousing programs out there, which are, are, are um, you know, helping people move into apartments of all types, private landlords, nonprofits. And when those um, situations don't work out and those apartments are damaged and they can't be brought back online and that landlord has felt like they've been left on, to their own, on, to the wolves, um, they're not going to get a new tenant back in there. And so this could help with that ongoing challenge. And if you want more questions on that, I, I'd encourage to, uh, you've talked to Sarah Phillips, um, have her in. All right. Um, well, thank you so much for your time. That was, um, wow, it was 40 minutes. So um, that, I will be here for questions. I'm just going to turn the camera off and drink sure. some water and clear my head for a second. And so um, we are going to take a five minute break before we get to uh, Commissioner Gresham. I'm sorry I gave you a promotion, um, Commissioner, uh, that was inadvertent. But um, That's well taken. Uh, we'll take five minutes and be back at 10.05. Morning, Mr. Chair. Morning. Good morning, nice and gray. Nice and gray. And windy. All right. Um, I'm going to go ahead and get started with Commissioner Gresham. Commissioner, thank you for coming in to talk about um, this budget adjustment. Um, as you know, as you just heard, Josh filled us in pretty much on some of the specific requests. I think we just would like you to fill in where your where the administration is coming from 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 your level, and um, and before we move to um, 
BHCB and BHFA on, on some of the specific program discussions. Happy to, thank you for uh, inviting me. Uh, good morning all. And, and, and happy new year. <laughs> and to you, yeah, happy holidays. So um, my only addition, and I thought uh, the commission did a great job, much better than I could have explaining the housing initiative. Um, this is the only uh, major uh, ARPA initiative in the budget adjustment. And my uh, only addition to that is uh, there was, uh, or there is in the uh, budget adjustment that we submitted a couple of weeks ago, one kind of wonky aspect to it in that there are two different funding sources for the housing initiative. Um, predominantly, uh, the uh, funding source is ARPA, um, and that is true for uh, the um, VHCB piece, uh, for the, um, the uh, VHFA piece um, as well. And um, the, uh, as well, uh, the um, VHIP piece too. So that's a total of $75 million that is, uh, the proposal is to fund with ARPA funds. But the uh, rental risk mitigation pool that the commissioner um, referred to uh, that uh, should you choose to um, can be better explained by our colleagues at DCF, uh, that is funded with general fund. So the 5 million rental risk mitigation pool is funded with general fund um, in large part or, or predominantly due to the fact that the agency of administration and our uh, consultant guide house thought that might be higher risk in terms of adhering to federal guidelines uh, for the uh, use of ARPA funds. Um, and thus uh, to ensure that uh, we didn't um, trip any red flags, uh, we would fund it with general fund. Um, the second um, point I would make, and the final point I make is that that um, is part of uh, a slightly larger initiative within DCF that may be of interest to your committee. Um, and that is that in addition to the $5 million to the rental risk mitigation pool, uh, there was approximately a half a million dollars for um, general assistance transport. Um, and that is for um, people who uh, may need a place to stay, uh, but may find that uh, the uh, available rooms uh, are used up in uh, their area. And thus um, there's a uh, appropriation to provide transport to them to other uh, shelters in, in other areas. In addition, there's about a half a million dollar uh, appropriation for the uh, rapid recovery housing initiative um, that uh, DCF can explain. So the combination of kind of what I would call housing initiatives is a little over $6 million, uh, but 5 million of that is the rental risk mitigation pool that the commissioner referred to, or, uh, referred to earlier. All of those are funded with general fund, um, the body of the proposal um, 75 million, which uh, is funded with ARPA. So I just uh, wanted to point that out um, within our budget adjustment, that is how we uh, presented it. Um, but when you kind of forget about the funding sources and just uh, pool it together, there's a total of $80 million of uh, pure kind of housing initiatives in the uh, budget adjustment that we presented several weeks ago. Oh, thank you. And, and I had also heard through the grapevine that there was an issue with, um, we had appropriated, we all had appropriated $9 million for weatherization in ARPA funds that might have to move over to general funds um, allocation. Is that, is that, did I hear that right? I don't know, but I will get back to you straight away. Um, that does ring a bell, um, but I, I don't have the details on that and I will get back to you on that. Okay. No, I appreciate that. Uh, you know, just if you can, I mean, we also have Representative Jessup is joining us today from the Appropriations Committee. Um, I believe the money for weatherization was going to go through VHFA, so maybe Maura Collins might have um, some information on that as well. Um, right. Uh, that was part of a $48 million uh, swap out of ARPA into general fund. Um, largely for the reasons uh, that uh, we thought. I think the VHFA piece was going to be operated as a revolving loan fund, now that you mention it. 
and I believe that was an issue also with ARPA that's not about loans. I don't think, I think their guidelines uh, point towards granting as opposed to a revolving loan fund. And I think that was the reason I think uh, Maura Collins can explain more, um, uh, more about that, but I think that was the reason. Okay, great. We'll, we'll get to her in, in a little bit. Um, Representative Kalaki has a question. Uh, John, you're muted. Thank you and good morning. Uh, good morning. Uh, in our earlier iterations of ARPA money uh, around housing, there also was an increase of wraparound services. Um, and I know that's not our committee, but it is integrated into the housing issue, especially for people transitioning homelessness. Is there, for the Human Services Committee, is there an increase in those dollars as well? as we look to build out even more housing, transitional housing for the homeless in this budget? And I, I think that um, the uh, DCF will be a good place to go for that question. Okay. The answer is yes, but I okay. think the details can be provided by Commissioner Brown better than I. Thank you very much. All right, any further questions for Commissioner Gresham right now? Um, um, I appreciate the um, the clarification on that on the uh, general fund the usage of the general fund money that that's helpful. Um, I see no further questions for the commissioner. So, commissioner, you're free to hang out and listen in, um, or go to your next meeting, which I'm sure is scheduled soon. Thank you. Um, all right. And so let's move on to um, BHCB. We have Gus Selig here and Jen Holler um, to present with um, their thoughts on the $50 million that's being requested in the, of ARPA funds for um, the purchase of more units. Um, Gus, welcome. Happy New Year. Happy New Year to the whole committee. Uh, thanks to both to you and to Commissioner Gresham and uh, Commissioner Hanford. Um, Jen's going to lead this uh, presentation off. We only have a few slides, so it'll be both a little bit of report to bring you up to date about why this uh, request is needed, um, uh, along with what the great progress that's been made over the last um, many months since we began the C with the CRF funding. And I just want to say, as a as a matter of course, in terms of reporting to you uh, on that CRF funding, um, we are returning a total of eighty six dollars to the state of Vermont. So all those funds, that thirty three million dollars that you pushed for, were well used, but for the last eighty six dollars. So with that, uh, Jen, the floor is yours to lead this presentation off. Thank you, Gus, and good morning. Happy New Year to everyone. It's very good to see your faces, um, and we appreciate the time before the committee. Um, I'm going to lead off because I didn't I didn't get to have the opportunity to speak to all of you when you had your joint hearing with um, House Human Services in October. You heard from Gus and uh, and Jenny, so a lot of that information, um, that background information, you already have, and um, we're going to provide, as Gus said, just a quick update to put the budget. Adjustment Act request into context um, and show you a little bit about what's been happening since then. So I'm going to share my screen. And if for any reason that doesn't work out, Ron also has the presentation and it's on your um, on your website committee's page. You have been made a co-host, so you should be able to. Okay. There you go. Right. Okay, good to go? Good. All right. Thank you, Chair Stevens. Um, so what, um, just to, by way of introduction, Gus mentioned the co coronavirus relief funds, those are out um, and people have moved in. Here's a, uh, the picture on the left is actually of a highly energy efficient modular home that was placed in a mobile home park in Bradford. And this is a picture of the, um, and least of um, households that were formerly experiencing homelessness. So, so, so this is a picture of a new, um, new resident um, getting oriented to their home in Bradford 
Uh, you might recall a conversation in your committee led by Representative Troiano about the, the idea of putting um, uh, similar homes in a park in Hardwick, and that has also happened. The, uh, the picture on the, on the left is of Zephyr, um, now called Zephyr Place in Williston. It was the former town suites, um, has been purchased uh, by the Champlain Housing Trust and is being converted to 38 homes for um, formerly homeless households with supportive services. And then there'll be 33, also 33 permanently affordable um, apartments for a mix of um, incomes between low and moderate income families. So last session, um, largely with, um, um, uh, with your committee's leadership, the legislature and the administration worked to appropriate um, now, it really is unprecedented is used a lot because it usually is the it really is the right word um, level of appropriations um, specifically for housing. So uh, from a combination of sources, you appropriated 144 million through the Vermont Housing and Conservation Board for the creation of new housing. Um, and this is uh, these are the different sources and this is where we are with it. Of that 144 million, 78 million has been committed to projects which means that there's about 66 million currently available. As Commissioner Hanford said, um, we have in hand applications for $50 million in projects. And those range from Franklin County to Wyndham County, from Bennington County up to Caledonia County, all corners of the state. Um, and so I think um, it would be helpful to kind of run through the different pots of where we are um, to help uh, put the, the BAA request into context. So you, you will recall H319 from last year, which you um, often refer, was often referred to as the fast track bill. Um, and there was $10 million in there specifically for housing and shelter that could get going and underway in 2021. That's all been fully committed. And the pictures you see along the left side of the screen are, um, are uh, examples of new housing that's either been created or is underway with those funds. So at the top left, you might recognize Rick DeAngelis, the executive director of a good, good Samaritan Haven, and he's standing in front of the former Twin City Motel in Berlin, which is being converted to 35 um, new beds and um, service space uh, for the homeless with lots of supports from Washington County Mental Health Capstone and others. And Downstreet Housing and Community Development is helping them with that development. The next photo down is an image from um, Stowe, and we're delighted to be able to cre be creating affordable housing in Stowe. It's not always an easy market to get into. Um, and there will be a total of 16 new apartments there, a combination of an existing building and two newly constructed buildings. The next one down is um, what was formerly known as the Phoenix House in, um, in Barrie. And that had been leased by the, well, in coordinate, Downstreet owns it, um, and in coordination with the um, Department of Corrections, it had been housing for those coming out of um, corrections facilities and allowing them to uh, transition. The Department of Corrections has moved away from that model, but that opened up this building, and it's being um, it's being repurposed and is now currently housing uh, uh, fifteen uh, people who had been experiencing homelessness and um, is being. Um, under uh, Good Sam's leadership. And then the final picture on the bottom is a former jail building. It's a historic building in downtown St. Johnsbury. Um, the building in the foreground, the gray one, is the former jailer's house. And those two buildings are being converted to nine permanently affordable apartments for people experiencing homelessness. And that construction, I guess I would say is about two thirds done now. Um, so that was the fast track bill of ARPA state fiscal recovery funds. There was $64 million appropriated. And um, at this point, 36.7 is available. You also created state general funds one time of 70 in the amount of 70 million and there's 30, 29, 30 million available in that right now. But again, we have 50, those combined to be 66. And again, we have $50 million in applications right now. Um, our board will, we'll be receiving another round of applications in, in February. As Josh mentioned, our board's meeting um, later this month to act on those 50 million in applications. And then we'll be doing 
additional board meetings and additional rounds of awards in the coming months. So with the money that's been committed so far, um, it will um, has or will fund the creation of 476 homes and beds. Most of them are rental units. That's where the largest need is. And 205 of those are explicitly dedicated to households experiencing homelessness. There are also 50 transitional units. So that Good Sam project is an example of that. We funded 51 home ownership units through the shared equity model throughout the state. Um, some accessibility projects through the Vermont Center for Independent Living and infrastructure improvements to 233 mobile home lots. Um, a point that would be good to make here is that I think you've, re you've heard us refer to the Housing Recovery Working Group. It's a working group of the housing funders, BHCB, the Department of Housing and Community Development, um, VHFA, and the Agency of Human Services, um, and the Vermont State Housing Authority. And we commit, uh, continue to meet on a bi-weekly basis to coordinate the different funding sources um, and do the best we can to ensure the strategic use of them all. So um, these projects were all funded in consultation with them and um, the communication between our agencies remains, um, remains high and at a really productive level, which we're happy to report. The, um, to get back to the ARPA SFR, the $50 million that's in the Governor's Budget Adjustment Act proposal, certainly VHCB supports that. We're very appreciative. The language is, and Gus will touch on this later, is the same as what was in um, the big bill last year. Um, and there are many ways in which that, uh, that funding, um, knowing that that funding is uh, there, is going to make improve our ability to use the existing funds more strategically and plan better for the future. Um, so for a few examples of what we funded with the supplemental funding is that there's been a lot of conversation about converting hotels and we get many requests for information and updates from other states actually who are, because we did a couple of these with CRF and other uh, jurisdictions are asking about how this has worked and you know what are the, some of the um, lessons learned. Here are just a few examples. There's the chalet um, down in Brattleboro and then um, Days Inn in Shelburne was recently purchased by the Champlain Housing Trust. Um, in Colchester, the former Handy Suites is now um, 21, um, apartments available to those who are fleeing sexual or domestic abuse. And then a new place in Burlington, um, you might recall that there was a proposal to um, stand up some quick housing to house those who are homeless um, on Sears Lane with uh, sort of temporary shipping container type structures. And our board was not comfortable with doing that, um, declined to fund that proposal proposal and then worked with others and um, a new place who was the proponent was able to find a, a former motel and convert that and um, that's now um, um, housing the homeless and it has community space and a kitchen as well. So with that, I'll hand it over to Gus. Okay, so just to um, give you a sense of what's going on around the state, um, the Top left um, is the Tuttle Block in Rutland, which is going through energy upgrades and the conversion of what was office space into three new apartments. Um, I'm pleased to tell you, and I know this was a question we got from Representative Kalaki, that we've just awarded uh, $500,000 to do repairs of farm worker housing around the state to the Champlain Housing Trust, who are working with UVM and UVM Extension to out do outreach to the farm community. Uh, we have in our hands a proposal for redevelopment of Harbor Place. They're replacing Harbor Place with another motel that we've helped them purchase as part of the GA program, but that site will be redeveloped as multifamily housing and hopefully also single family housing as you've begun to discuss. Um, Firehouse Lane in Bristol is a long time project, uh, community redevelopment project in Bristol that is gonna become uh, 20 or 25 rental apartments uh, along with other improvements and new firehouse in the community. And then Fox Run in Berlin is attached uh, adjacent to the, to the Berlin Mall. There is already under construction, 100 units of elderly housing. This will be family housing. That will be a short walk from the school. So let's move on to the next slide, Jen. Um, this just is a slide we've put together to give you a sense of what's being accomplished around the state and where the 
how quickly people are are moving. So over a three year period, almost over 1,100, uh, we've funded over 1,100 units with just about half, 45% over 500 apartments for people who've experienced homelessness. That's in large part because of the CRF funding, but it, it is typical for 25% of the projects we fund to be providing homes for the homeless. Since January of 2020, uh, that's 475 new units have come on, already come online with over half for the homeless. Uh, by the end of this year, we'll add 386 apartments, including 190 for the homeless and more in 2023. As we appropriate more funding, there'll be more units in 2023 available, more apartments uh, in 2023. Uh, that number will grow and then we'll begin to move into 2024. Among those numbers are 50 new shelter beds, um, which you've just seen Jen uh, display photos of. There were improvements made to 13 shelters. Um, the Agency of Human Services will tell you that last year they provided housing, permanent housing to 1,300 Vermonters who experienced homelessness. And that's far and away a record number. Some of that comes from the new homes that we put online. Some of it comes from the VHIP units that Josh has talked with you about. And then, uh, and this is a part of the value of having so many highly qualified nonprofit developers working in partnership with the local agency of human service contractors of 1,248 apartments that came up for rent across the state last year, they provided a third of them, over 400, to people who'd been experiencing homelessness uh, during the pandemic. Uh, so a big part of the progress we've made has come from putting new units online, and another part of the progress has been VHIP, and then this last part has been um, also that within the existing portfolio, making more units available to folks. Um, and as we said, more more will grow. In terms of the need and the problem, and, and Josh really spoke to this, Commissioner Hanford spoke to this, in the 1980s, we were increasing our housing stock 1.66% each year. In the past five years, we're less than 0 0.2, 0 0.18. Um, so that's a huge drop in new housing production. There's a lot of reasons for that. Um, but it really speaks to the shortage we're feeling. Long before the pandemic, Josh's agency did a needs assessment that projected the need for over 2,000, over 2,500 apartments by 2025. The pandemic has brought new pressures to the housing market. Um, and that's some of that it has been, and you've all experienced this, new, new Vermonters. Uh, and whether they are new Vermonters who are f fleeing places because of COVID or new Afghan refugees, we have an increase in the number of people. There are more investors looking to invest in real estate today, uh, driving up the cost of housing. Uh, there's more Airbnb, B &B. there's more conversion of single family homes to rentals, which further restricts the rental market. Um, and one of the problems that a housing economist will tell you is that when people who could move into home ownership are stuck in the rental market and they're making 80 to or $100,000 a year and they're competing with the Vermonters we typically house, half of whom have incomes below 22,000 a year. Guess who loses out in that competition? It's low income Vermonters. Uh, there's an apartment just down the road from me in, in East Callis Village that three years ago was renting for 850 a month in front porch form. It was advert an apartment in that building was advertised for 1500 a month. Uh, last night. Um, so we're seeing price spikes everywhere. The low vacancy rates that we have give landlords the opportunity to raise rents. That's a natural thing. And so what we have seen over and over again, despite the availability of lots of rental vouchers and rental assistance, is that people are having are having a hard time finding their finding apartments. Despite the progress we've made, there are still about 1,300 households remaining temporarily in motels. Um, and I think that the proposal that the governor has made really goes back to what you did with the fast track bill. It sends us, I can't tell you that all those funds will be needed and placed into use by June 30th, 
this year, but it's going to send a very important signal to people who are developing projects or thinking about developing projects that dollars are available to support their projects. So let's move on to the next slide. Um, this just gives you a little bit of an idea of what the opportunity is. We have a proposal in front of us for the uh, drawing you see, which is at a church and adjacent land near the Haven in White River Junction. Uh, there's a municipal building that is slated for upper floor use as affordable housing. Uh, and there is discussions up in Newport uh, about conversion of the old convent into affordable housing. I could go around the state and tell you that Christ Church in Montpelier wants to build 25 apartments on their site. Um, there are four sites being considered in Waterbury, Mr. Chairman. Uh, there are two sites available in Bennington uh, that could provide 60 units of housing. There is a downtown site in Hartford. There are sites being looked at in Middlebury. So the signal you will send if you can, you and the appropriators can support the governor's request will be a very positive one in terms of telling the development community uh, more dollars are on the way and they should be continuing to gear up to produce more housing as quickly as we possibly can. So let's move on to the next slide. Um, you saw this at our presentation um, when, when you met with the, with the other, with the, with the um, Human Services Committee, but I think it's worth uh, reiterating. The successes are that housing is coming online quickly. There is tremendous coordination uh, and strategic collaboration in terms of capital, subsidies, and services, um, both among housing agencies, with our friends at the State Housing Authority, with VHFA, with the department, with the Agency of Human Services, and at the community level. And we are seeing everyone across the state use coordinated entry to help fill those units that are targeted to people who've experienced homelessness. Um, it is new for some of the private developers that we work with to house the homeless, house people who've experienced homelessness, but they are, um, we are finding that they are willing to do that. The price spikes that they are experiencing means that their projects don't go forward without some other assistance. So the ARPA SFR program is well underway. There are big challenges and the biggest one which we spoke to the committee about is cost um, and the cost of housing is frightening uh, at this moment. Um, I hope there'll be stability in the market um, in the coming year. Uh, the price of wood seems to have stabilized but other products are continue to be uh, problematic. The market conditions are still pointing toward displacement. The example I just gave of a rental apartment in East Callis Village, I think is just typical of what's going on all over the state. We do need to strengthen service delivery. And I think that's part of why you see the risk pool proposal in front of you. Um, we need to enhance development capacity. We did take some of the state general funds to provide um, one-time assistance to the development community to, uh, that we work with on a regular basis to enhance the staffing. But like every other sector of the economy, finding qualified people right now is a challenge. So the investments we made this fall will begin to bear fruit next spring, summer, and fall. Um, we sprinted to do the CRF work. I'm obviously very proud of that work. I really appreciate the support that you gave us uh, to do that. Um, but the pace of development is usually not that quick and can't be sustained. Uh, we need to be moving to more of a mode of running a marathon than running a sprint. And then last and important, uh, Treasury guidance continues to be an issue in terms of the utilization of ARPA SFR in conjunction with the low income housing tax credit and particularly the 4% tax credit. It's something that we, after we met we with you, we had a meeting with Treasury um, and the Leahy team and the Sanders team are continuing to work on getting the Treasury to alter their guidance. Uh, and we're optimistic that ultimately that will change, but it is a problem going forward. I see there's at least one hand up, so I'm happy to uh, take a question. 
or more than a question? Two hands up. We have two hands up right now, um, Representative Priano, then Bloomley. Thank you, uh, and thank you, Gus and Jen. And, you know, uh, I can't I can't tell you how much that I personally appreciate what you folks do and the expedience in which these funds were um, brought into the or put out in the field and the, and the work that you've accomplished. I did. <clears throat> I was very happy to hear the one piece about the Sacred Heart Con uh, uh, Convent up in Newport because I met with housing advocates up there, and there's no shelter available currently in Orleans County. There's about 93 homeless people and about 30 children involved in that. Um, and, um, you know, I heard from uh, school uh, superintendents or, or coordinators that have hired teachers who were unable to fulfill their contract because they couldn't find a place to live. So I just wanted to point out that there does seem to be a void uh, in Orleans County uh, for, um, uh, for services and, uh, and, um, and housing uh, initiatives and uh and i do appreciate the and how many uh, units would you anticipate being in the uh, sacred heart uh, con uh, convent uh, Gus? um well we don't have a, a proposal in front of us yet i know it's something that rural edge is working on so i'm going to check in with them and i will get you that answer representative triano great thank you thanks very much representative bloomley Hi, Gus. Thanks very much um, for, for all this information, um, for the slides, which will be really helpful um, in uh, reminding me about all the figures that you've quoted, but also um, uh, for, you know, the, the work you've done to try to address needs that we have been talking about over the last, well, 10 years, um, but now had the money to actually pursue. I guess I'm wondering how the workforce shortage um, in construction is affecting things and whether VHCB, you know, um, is working with the administration. I mean, what are we doing to build um, um, that core of, um, of workers? Um, that's a good question that I don't think I'm qualified to answer. And you given your background, you may be in a better position to answer. But what I can tell you is that, you know, there are a lot of people that I have known for 35 years who used to pound nails, who are putting their, who are my age, or even a little younger, who are putting their uh, air guns down, and uh, maybe they're building cabinets for people, but they're stopping building houses. And it is a real problem and crisis. Um, Jeannie Morrissey, one of our great builders, said, you know, one of the good things out of this is people are making more money um, after wages not going up for a long time. Um, you know, our job is not workforce development uh, precisely. Um, there are other parts of state government that are addressing this, but clearly the shortage of people in the trades is one of the reasons that costs are going up. It's not the only reason materials have been a real problem. Uh, supply chain interruptions have been a real problem. Um, and the price of real estate is a real problem, but, but clearly the labor shortage affects everything. And it also affects our nonprofit partners. Um, one of our organizations lost their CFO to healthcare. And the director said to me, what used to be an $80,000 a year job probably has to now be a six figure job. Um, it is affecting people's abilities who are right on the front lines of this pandemic who do property management. And that work is much more difficult in the face of a pandemic. So, so the workforce issues go to every piece of our work, not just the trades work, but that clearly has an impact on cost and on the availability of contractors um, across the state. And clearly um, I, probably should be sitting in a meeting with folks at the Department of Labor and other parts of state government that are dealing more with workforce um, to address your question more fully. Well, I mean, it's something obviously that we, <laughs> I mean, we, we've seen the average age of construction workers go up, nudge up, and our investment in that next pipeline has 
um, been pretty minimal. And um, so and that's not necessarily for this committee to deal with, but I just wanted to know your perspective on, I mean, what you're hearing from developers. So thanks. Um, thank you. That was actually like kind of a perfect segue for my question. Um, this one is a little bit less refined and more of a, I don't know, an abstract thought question. So if one of the issues that we're having right now, especially uh, recruiting from out of state is there's nowhere for folks to live, right? That's, that's a huge barrier of getting access to younger qualified workers. Has there been any thought given to working in conjunction with construction outfits and possibly like working with them in, 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 in a state agency, possibly with dollars to build housing for construction workers so we can get the construction workers in to build more housing? Like I said, this is kind of an out of the box thought, but has anybody teased out an idea like that, a partnership or a relationship? Um, not that specifically. There's been discussion, and I think it's probably most uh, pronounced in the upper valley where employers are talking about, um, you know, and supporting the development of workforce housing and bringing resources uh, to a loan fund, I believe, to help support housing development and being very active in the planning and permitting of housing. But there, um, but, but the idea you've just thrown out is one that we're happy to explore with partners. Um, you know, we are seeing, because we border New York and New Hampshire and Massachusetts, we are seeing subcontractors come in to work on projects from those other jurisdictions as well. Yeah, correct. And you see that very much so during the summer road construction yeah. season. We're putting them up, in, or, or not we, but like their employers are putting them up in hotels and whatnot seasonally. And that's just kind of like been something that's existed for years, if not decades. You know, I what I was thinking of, and it's like I said, this is like a totally out of the box idea of a friend of mine who is um works at uh, Rutland's economic development office, uh, Josh Jerome, we were kind of throwing some ideas at the wall about a week, week and a half ago. And this is one of the things we were teasing out is like, it kind of makes sense, but it's kind of sounds insane, but we're kind of living in an insane world right now. So I just, while we had everybody here, I wanted to throw it on the table yeah, as I, a green teaser. I mean, I, mean, I think it, it doesn't matter what part of the economy you're looking at, you know, that I'm sure you're among people talking about the nursing shortage. Um, the, the workforce shortage, and I think this is part of why the governor is saying, let's really go continue to go big on housing with ARPA as a once in a lifetime opportunity for Vermont is we, we need more people in our workforce at, at, at every level. And there aren't affordable places for people to live, even people making what we all have thought about as relatively good salaries. Okay, cool. Hey, that was that was all I wanted to like bring up right now. Thank you for for letting me kind of have that thought dump. All right, um, Representative Kalaki, then Howard, and um, then I want to be able to take a break after those questions. Uh, thank you, Chair, and uh, hello to Gus, and um, welcome uh, to our committee, and Jen, of course, uh, and thank you for all your help with communicating with me off season. Um, on slide one, if we could go to that slide, um, we, we, we had 51 home ownership units, and that is with the shared equity program, I believe. Is that correct? Yes, do that's we, correct. Okay. And do we have the demographics of, because part of the incentive in that program was to do substantial outreach to the BIPOC communities, and so mm -hmm. do we know of the 51 home ownership units, the demographics of that? Um, so what I can tell you is that so far we're, we're um, I think we've got pick up on 13 units and I'm gonna have to get back to you on the demographics of the thir first 13 home buyers uh, in that, but I will do that. And I know, and we've talked about this before, there's a 20 unit condominium under construction in downtown Winooski that is being marketed in particular to, to communities of color. Um, so that work is underway, but I can't tell you the demographics 
today. I can tell you that over the last five years, the Champlain Housing Trust reports that a quarter of the folks they've moved into home ownership um, have been people of households of color. Um, but I don't know that the exact number. I just know that it's a quarter of all the households. And in general, we are seeing 30 or 40 turnovers in shared equity homes every year that are being recirculated as affordable homes in Vermont. Okay. And then uh, could you, I, I, was, I was talking to Josh about this and I wanna make sure I understand the revolving loan fund idea that was funded, I think through general funds. And is that what's funding this for 51 home ownership? Um, we're not using a, a revolving loan fund. It's a direct uh, subsidy that helps the home buyer um, purchase a home. What I can tell you is that it's moving a little bit more slowly than it has in the past. And my staff report that there are, you know, so it's, it's generally a buyer initiated program. They have a certain amount of subsidy to work with and they go find a home that fits their needs in conjunction with a local organization like CHT that helps to keep it affordable over time. Um, and in some cases, people have simply been outbid in the marketplace, which I think speaks to the, the importance of permanent affordability that, you know, it just runs, this market is showing how quickly affordability runs away from us. Um, and we may have to deepen the subsidies to help people into home ownership. I think there's also a need, as we're doing with the downtown Winooski project, and as we'd like to do um, with creating more units, both of the type Josh talked about, but also those are, that are permanently affordable. One of the things we expect to recommend to our board in January is to fund the risk pool that uh, Josh spoke about briefly and that we will, um, and that Maura will talk about more in a few minutes. Uh, just to help get units built. Since the since the meltdown in 2008, what banks have done is to say, we're not gonna finance condo development unless you can show us 50% pre-sales. So the risk pool will help developers by, uh, more easily obtain financing by providing some insurance that, of, that the units will ultimately be sold or there'll be some way to repay those loans. So that's a piece of this that we're gonna work on with VHFA. And yes, may I, oh, Representative Kalaki, I wonder if I could help orient to another part of your question. And that is that the, um, so Thank you. the home ownership units here are not funded through that special appropriation you referred to of, okay. the, of the 70 million of state general funds you see here on this chart. Our board targeted three million of that specifically to shared equity home ownership, and that's where, um, and it's expected to create 51 units, 13 of which have been completed. Okay, thank you. And but this special appropriation is where now? This is not in this slide. No, it did not come to us. I don't. I'm not honestly quite sure what special appropriation you're referring to. I thought there was a five million dollar shared equity uh, revolving loan fund. It was going to be a million dollars a year for over five years. That was an S-79. Um, oh, oh, so that hasn't happened. Okay, yeah. I, thank you. I apologize for being unclear about that. I thank you very much. And really, thank you for your work. It's incredible. Thank you. All right, Representative Howard. Thank you. Um, first of all, welcome, um, Gus and Jen. I'm, it's so nice to see you. Um, and uh, to let you know that we are thrilled about the Tuttle block here in Rutland. We need so much more of that. Um, I just really wanted to comment on um, what uh, Representative Byron had said, I totally agreement with, with uh, his comment. Uh, we have such a shortage of nurses and teachers, police and, and firemen and women. I, I just wonder if, if you're aware of any thoughts to offer perhaps free housing for a certain length of time um, to these people um, with like an option to buy. Um, that's an idea 
worth exploring. Um, I'm not quite sure how we'd make it work, but let us um, brainstorm about that as we talk more about the home ownership proposals that uh, we're all going to work on together. Um, clearly, you know, again, we have a labor shortage that is affecting every part of our economy. Uh, and if it's hard for a teacher, a cop, a firefighter to find housing, those essential workers who stack the shelves in our grocery stores are also having a really mm -hmm. hard time. So, and I just want to say it's great to see you. It was great to see you at uh, the opening of the old, of the Lincoln Place, the old school. Oh, that yes. was a wonderful project. And I haven't seen Representative Hango ask a question yet, but I did, did want to note that among the projects we'll bring to our board in January is a proposal from the Champlain Housing Trust for 15 units that will help to serve folks up in St. Albans so we're, um, who've been experiencing homelessness, often fleeing domestic violence or other sorts of um, issues that have caused homelessness. Right. Thank, Thank you. you. So, so uh, Gus and Jen, before we take a break, what, how many slides do you have left for us? I think there's a closing slide after this one. This is the governor's uh, recommendation. Okay, which we- And the language is, is identical to what was passed before. Sure. Um, all right. So, so, and we just here, just as an example of a project we funded many years ago, and there's room for a 24 unit building and Cathedral Square Corporation who wants to do this, has a waiting list of 850. And I think uh, for this project in Heinsburg, the waiting list is over 100. So, uh, and the great thing, you know, we, we do not do a lot of age restricted housing, but it does have the impact of when people move in of freeing up other apartments and homes in the community. So there is a need for this as well. So with that, we just wanna thank the committee for your great support of our work and um, Really appreciate it, and, we're, and we will follow up with a couple of the questions you asked that we didn't have uh, specific data on, and get back to you. No, I appreciate you taking the time to fill us in on this on this particular request. There is always more questions that come up with some of the facts that you you bring us, um, but we'll save some of that for uh, for the normal budgeting process. Um, and I think it's re it's important to remember that that there will be. Um, a normal budgeting process where more funds will be requested for similar programs or for or for um, different ways of using um, um, general fund dollars also to to fund the building. But this is um, this is pretty clear about what the goals are for this fifty million dollars. And um, thank you for your time. Okay. Thank you. Thanks for having us today.